Uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan to this uh, Meet the Press evening and our very distinguished guest. Uh, I'm your MC this evening. My name is Peter Lang, and I'm the uh, president of the club. Um, a few words. Uh, I first came across Hans myself, uh, I think it was in 2005, which he may not remember, but um, he was then working for Bloomberg News, which is mentioned here on his, um, his little uh, handout. And I was about to come uh, to Japan. I was working in Singapore at Bloomberg, but I was uh, offered the job here as the uh, bureau chief in in Tokyo. So I was quite excited about it. And um, Hans was working in the Bloomberg office. And obviously, being an experienced editor, I was very grateful for the fact that people like him were we're working here, but then right before I arrived, he quit. <laughs> 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 so <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure if it was something to do with my arrival or uh, some other reason. But, but anyway, you didn't get there soon enough. <laughs> yeah, no, I was too slow. Um, so he went on uh, from Bloomberg, as you can see from again from the handout, uh, to uh, much. Uh, much more bigger and greater things. He's had a very extensive uh, journalistic career and much more to come, I believe, uh, in many countries covering uh, many, many different topics. Uh, of course, now he's the Asia editor for Automotive News. As you can see from the title today, uh, he's talking about Japan's auto industry at its peak at Poise for Change. Um, so enough from me, and I'll hand everything over to Hans, if we can just give a warm welcome to our speaker this evening. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all. Uh, thanks for coming out today. I see we have a nice, small, intimate gathering. Uh, I'll make a few comments, and I have a presentation uh, to give everybody today. Uh, and then hopefully we can get into a Q&A session and maybe talk about some topics that are of interest to you. Um, again, thanks for coming out. I know it's a beautiful night. This finally stopped raining, so you could be outside uh, drinking beer instead of being here, but I'll try to make this as interesting and painless as possible. It's a little bit interesting for me to be on this side of the table because usually, as a journalist, I'm on that side asking the questions, so I'm, I'm surrounded now by uh, experts, and it's a little bit intimidating, but I'll just uh, begin with, with the day's title. Uh, I want to talk about Japan's auto industry. I, I title this At the Peak and Poise for change. And I want to talk a, a little bit first about where I'm coming from so you can see uh, what automotive news is. And then I'll get into my presentation. Oops. Um, automotive news. It's a uh, industry publication. I don't think there's anything quite like it in the world, actually. It's a group of publications. As you can see down there, we have many brands and subsidiary uh, sister publications. We're a, uh, a flagship publication of Crane Communications Incorporated, and that's a publishing house based in Detroit, Michigan. Our automotive news flagship uh, brand has been, uh, was founded in 1925, almost as old as the auto industry, and older, in fact, than many of the um, auto companies here in Japan. Uh, we have about 55 journalists in seven countries, uh, paid circulation of 65,000 readers, um, of course, nowadays, the, uh, it's a weekly publication in paper, so it comes out every Monday in a paper. We're, we still have a paper edition. Um, of course, the, oh, the website is increasingly a major uh, player for us, and we have one million unique online visitors a month, and about uh, nearly five million monthly online page views. So uh, we have quite an online presence. It's a 24-hour uh, uh, seven-day-a-week operation for our website. If you are interested in automotive news, industry news, that is, uh, this is your one-stop shop where you can read and learn and watch just about anything that has to do with the auto industry. Uh, we have uh, automotive news as the flagship. We have a dedicated one called Automotive News Europe. It's in English with, uh, with, auto with a European focus. We have Automotive News China, which is published in Chinese and English. That's a, just a newsletter. It's an online publication only. Uh, 
Then we have Automobile Volka, and that is in German only. That's specialized, uh, focused on the German market. And then we just launched this new publication called Automotive News Canada, and that is in English. I don't think we have a fr French edition of this. <laughs> Um, about myself, uh, it's a little bit too small to read, not even I can read it, but I'm the Asia editor from, for Automotive News. I've been here in this role since 2007. Um, I'm also an instructor at the Graduate School of Journalism at Waseda University, and I've been doing that as a moonlighting job just in the evenings uh, since 2009. So that is essentially just beer money for me, and I do it as a hobby. Uh, formerly, uh, most of my career before this was with the Associated Press. I was a news editor and a correspondent with them working in Tokyo, in Seoul, in Frankfurt, New York, and I got started in Portland, Oregon. And as uh, Peter pointed out, I was also a, briefly an editor at Bloomberg News here in Tokyo. Okay. So let's talk about why the, the auto industry, is, I say, is at its peak right now, okay? And that is because um, if you look by many standards, the Japan auto industry is at its peak. If we look, check out, uh, for example, record net income. I, I, these are the companies down here, and it shows you what year they achieved record levels of record net income. So we have uh, 2016, this is a year that just ended in March. Uh, Toyota is way up here. It's the giant Godzilla in the room. It had its record net income uh, in 2016, the most recent year. Uh, Subaru also had its record net income then, and Suzuki as well. Not too far behind them, we have Nissan, Honda, and Mitsubishi. I'm oh, sorry, Nissan, Mazda, and Mitsubishi. And then back here, we have Honda back in 2008 before the financial crisis. And this is a little bit, uh, it's, I include Honda here, but it's hard to include these as an apples to apples comparison because Honda just changed the way that they do their accounting. And so that starting from this year, um, they, you can't, they change the way they're doing their accounting essentially. So you cannot really compare it, but it gives you a, a, a good, um, I don't know, an, an oranges to apples comparison at least. Uh, operating profit, even more dramatic increase. All uh, six of the seven major automakers here achieve their record operating profit in the year that just ended. And again, you can see that Toyota is just leaps and bounds, uh, hugely profitable, way up at the top. Uh, you know, n Honda's record was over here, it's number two. Nissan uh, follows in number three position. But all of them had a great year last year in operating profit. Uh, revenue as well, okay? We look back here, this is before the financial crisis, so you see a lot of record revenue actually being achieved before the financial crisis. Uh, a lot of that also was driven, I think, by the yen at the time, which helped the revenue look more impressive. But still, we have a lot of these companies achieving their record revenues in 2015 and 2016. Um, we have Toyota, of course, we have uh, Nissan, Subaru, and Honda actually had its record revenue uh, last year as well. Um, and record unit sales, okay? That's kind of the benchmark measure that we use to uh, measure how the, the companies are doing in, in a way. Um, again, it's all bunched around 2015 and 2016, as you can see here. Um, Mitsubishi, uh, kind of an outlier. It, uh, even, even Honda here is, is a record sales last year, but we look at Mitsubishi, which has had a couple rough years, hasn't really recovered very well from the financial crisis. It, it goes back to before the financial crisis where it had its record sales. Okay. Now I call it a roller coaster ride, and this is, this is the yen over these, this period, okay? We see um, it was very uh, expensive back in 2010. It got even more expensive, more expensive. This was the lean years when they, it was really putting pressure on the profitability. And then, of course, we saw a dramatic weakening of the yen up through uh, June, around this time last year. It was uh, very, very weak, as you can see. And that is one reason we see these record profits that, um, 
that we are uh, looking at here. That's why in 2015, uh, that's one of the reasons I should say, not the only reason, but one of the reasons we saw these huge profits coming in here because the yen had returned to this, these very weak levels. And during this period here, I, I say it's one of the reasons that they had achieved a, a record profit, but not the only reason because during these years of extra high yen, they were very active in cutting costs and making their own, their own practices and their own production processes very efficient so that when the, when the um, yen returned to these uh, record low levels uh, or these uh, historic low levels, uh, they were ready to cash in big time and make uh, windfall profits. Now we see this coming back down. This is where we are today, around today, and it's going to have a big effect on the profits going forward. So while we have this record, we're just coming off a record year of profits, we're looking ahead to the current year that ends in, the fiscal year that ends in March of 2017, we're going to see a dramatic tail off in uh, product, uh, profit growth this year. And I put, that, I put this uh, picture of the Infinity factory here because Infinity and some of these other brands, this is actually, uh, let's see, this is Lexus here, this is Acura. Acura hardly makes any cars here in, in uh, Japan, but uh, Infinity at, at the bottom does. And these are the luxury brands that are made here in Japan and they're exported overseas. So you'll see that they, think they are especially sensitive to this rise and fall in the yen. Okay. So what kind of changes can we expect going forward? Um, well, profits will be shrinking. We already talked about that. On the back of the appreciating yen, the yen's getting more expensive. That's going to eat into uh, major profits this year. Um, and investment demands are increasing, okay? Thanks to more diverse markets. Basically, all these companies are now playing in very, very diverse markets from places like India to the United States to China, um, Africa. It's becoming more of a global industry and they have to tailor their products now to all these different markets with different safety techniques, uh, different safety regulations, different uh, fuel economy regulations. All that is putting demand on R&D and product development. At the same time, we're seeing a dramatic rollout in autonomous driving and safety requirements. That's putting a huge strain on their R&D uh, requirements and their R&D budgets. Same with fuel economy re regulations. Okay. All of that is, is also pressuring profits because they have to spend more to make better cars. Um, volume and sales and scale is increasing. Okay. This is especially true for a company like Toyota. They're now in a new league, the 10 million league they call it. Okay. And uh, they're the first automaker that's trying to get into this, make a sales and production of 10 million units a year. And they are now trying to figure out how they can do that sustainably because it's a very complex uh, production uh, juggling match that they have to do. And as all these companies increase their scale and their volume, they have to basically cope with a very increased biz uh, complex business and production models that they haven't dealt with before. Finally, all of their R&D and, and the bulk of their pr production backbone is based here in Japan, right? But the new mantra of the auto industry is to build where you sell. That is, to make the cars in the markets where you sell them. But Japan is saddled with most of its, uh, I don't know, firepower, if you will, most of its capital in Japan. And that's a down downside because the, the home market is declining, okay? So they're kind of trapped at home in a, in a market that's declining. It's about five million now. The sales dropped, I think, about uh, 9% in 2015, the, the market here. So it's around five million cars, but that's way down from the, the peak of, let's say, the bubble years, and it's been a gradual decline over this year, and there's no real prediction where it's gonna go except gradually down, down, down. Let's talk about drivetrain trends. We we talked a little bit about why uh, they have to invest a lot, right? That's to make these, um, these new, more efficient cars for places like the United States, Europe, even China now are coming out with high, uh, very strict regulations to make their cars clean. And you'll see here that they're coming out with these very sophisticated drivetrains, especially the Japanese. All of them have some degree of uh, sophisticated approach. And 
not all of them do it the same way, and that is partly to do because of their own limited R&D budgets. But let's take a look at the kinds of um, strategies they're pursuing. We have Toyota here. It's basically banking on hybrid cars and hydrogen fuel cell cars. That's where, where it sees its green cars going. Nissan we have next, electric vehicles. And just last week they came out with their own take on fuel cells. It's not a hydrogen fuel cell, but a e-bio fuel cell. And that is uh, using basically alcohol uh, to make the hydrogen on board for a hydrogen fuel cell. So that's their take on it. Honda focuses more, follows more of a Toyota model uh, hybrids and hydrogen fuel cells. Subaru, very, very limited budget, very, very small sales. Um, they don't have a lot of resources to throw into this, so they are just sticking with the old school, more efficient internal combustion engines, going with downsized turbo uh, engines. They're, they're kind of dabbling a little bit with hybrids, but they don't have the, the technology in-house to do it themselves. So when they do get into hybrids, when they do introduce it, they lean on their partnership with Toyota to fill that out. In-house, they just try to make their own engines more efficient. Mazda, again, another small player. They're in the same bind. They're really uh, a small player that has that kind of budget constraint that we see at Subaru. They also are fin focusing on more efficient internal combustion engines. Their strategy, however, is this thing called HCCI, which is kind of like a holy grail of, of uh, engine engineering, if you will, engine technology. Stands for homogeneous charge combustion uh, ignition, <laughs> if I got that right. And it's basically uh, a new, very efficient way of taking gasoline, putting it in the engine, and combusting it and pressurizing it so hard and so, so uh, at such heat that the gasoline combusts automatically by itself. And you don't have to use a charge, uh, like, in a, like a spark plug, to set off the explosion. And no one can figure this out because it's very hard to, to um, very, very hard to manage, basically, to get the temperatures correct and whatnot. But Mazda sees this as its best bet for a second generation internal combustion engine. And then Mitsubishi down here, its, it's next generation is basically these hybrids, mostly plug-in hybrids, and electric vehicles. It sees itself as also a leader in this technology. All very expensive stuff. It all costs a lot of money for the customer to buy, and it all costs a lot of money to develop. Another big money drain right here, safety trends, okay? This is where everybody is going these days. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the features here. ADAS, which stands for Advanced Driver Assist Systems, okay? Uh, autonomous driving features, that's probably what you read about like with the Google car, a self-driving car that can steer itself down the street. You don't need to have your hands on the wheel. That's the, the ultimate extreme manifestation of that. Um, and then uh, most automakers are targeting some kind of autonomous driving feature by 2020, here, even here in Japan. Uh, last year at the Tokyo Motor Show was kind of a watershed event for th this autonomous driving. All of the Japanese automakers made that part of their announcement for the Tokyo Motor Show. By 2020, we will have some kind of a autonomous driving feature, okay? And of course, the quest here for art artificial intelligence. That is considered this kind of uh, deep, deep learning software is considered the backbone that you need to have successful autonomous driving features. The, the problem is the auto companies are not software companies and they don't have the, the expertise in this kind of software programming to do it in-house. That's why you see a lot of companies these days teaming up with uh, technology companies from places like Silicon Valley. Now I showed a couple examples here of cars that we've ridden. Has anybody here ever driven an autonomous car or a, a car equipped with advanced driver safety systems or one that can automatically stop if it sees like something, if it sees an obstacle up ahead? Anybody? Okay. All right, so what was your experience with that? Any? Yeah, the first time uh, a little bit strange. Uh, something is an <laughs> obstacle in front of you and then you are not really sure if the car really breaks, but it's great. So, uh, Basically, the system are working, but uh, I think it uh, needs also some uh, driver strain. 
to get used to the systems and then get familiar and confident yeah. okay. in the system. Yeah. This will also take some time. Anybody else? Did you, you did you have a similar experience? Did you crash your car? Did your did yours work in time? Uh, it did. But it did. It took some brain training for myself as well. Oh, to trust the car. To trust the car. Okay. Uh, I, I was driving the eyesight technology, which. Was okay. Was I had a tendency that my foot wanted to break. And yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So it's it's very. Um, it's very impressive technology. All the, comp all the car companies have some kind of version of it, but it doesn't always work for, for, uh, as intended, and it's kind of tricky. For example, I put up two examples here. Um, this one is Toyota with their new Prius. This came out last year, and they had an example of the Prius being equipped with an auto, brakes, uh, auto pre collision braking system, for example. So you have this dummy walking into the lane of the, the, or the path of the car. And without the driver doing anything, the car is supposed to stop before hitting the, uh, the dr this dummy. Well, most times it works, but it, has to, it didn't work one time when I was in the car. And, the, and the, the engineer had to take it, had to take the car and stop the car by itself. And we, we asked, well, why is that? Well, there are some limitations. It depends on exactly how, it has to recognize this dummy's form exactly as a human being. And if one thing is, if the angle is not quite right, or the arms aren't quite right, or whatever, it, and it can't recognize this as a human being, then it won't necessarily stop. In fact, the engineer who I was riding with said that if there's a tree in the road, or if there's a horse in the road, it doesn't necessarily stop, because it does, it's programmed to see this as a human, okay? Um, now, this, these are just kinks that are, I mean, obviously stopping for a human is better than stopping for nothing, right? Or just running over the human. But, and these are kinks that are being worked out. But you can see some limitations. Now here is, this is Nissan. They, have, they're, they are very advanced, they're very bullish about their self-driving technology, okay? And uh, also around the time of the Tokyo Motor Show, they had this leaf, this is a leaf, uh, equipped to do self-driving uh, self-driving demo. So we were out by um, the big site area on Odaiba and they had it mapped out so that we could go pretty far. I, I don't know how many kilo kilometers it was, maybe five kilometers or something in this big loop and um, the car was driving itself. I was sitting in the passenger seat, not uh, in the driver's seat. The engineer in charge of this was sitting in the driver's seat, but um, it was driving itself in traffic doing the loop very well. Um, it was a couple jerky movements occasionally when it was trying to adjust itself to the lane. And then um, all of a sudden we were going at this one intersection and it was supposed to make a left turn, but instead of making the left turn, it just kept going straight through this T intersection. So it was a T intersection like this and if we went straight we were going to go right off the road. And so they, the, the, uh, the engineer had to quickly grab onto the wheel and then pull it over. And next thing we know, we're in a pit stop uh, on the side of the road here. Okay, so he's like, oh man, we have to fix the, the computer. And basically somehow the computer went offline in the middle of this demo and shut down. So he, so he flings open the back of the car. And as you can see, there's a huge giant computer in the back seat of the car. The whole back end of the car is a computer, okay? And this is what he is needed to run this company on a car on an autonomous mode. On the outside, it looks pretty normal. There's a lot of sensors around the car, but it looks fairly normal on the outside. But the, kick, the trick is there's a huge computer in the back, and he needed to reboot it. Now we asked him, oh, has this ever happened before? No, this was the only time it's ever it's never happened before. This is the first time in all the demos we've done. Well, later on, uh, the, the following week, I was talking with another uh, journalist here at the club who was also on this demo, and the same thing happened to him. <laughs> so it at least happened twice. I don't know if, that, if the person experienced it after me or before me, but you can see that there are some uh, tricks. Okay? Uh, here's another great example, too. This is, uh, again, Toyota's autonomous driving system. It's in a Lexus. Okay? They, again, took us out on some highways in, um, around the Odaiba area. And it's very impressive. You can, it's hard to see in this picture, but there's some sensors up around here that help it steer by itself. The idea behind this concept is it, once you get through the toll gate on the highway, it drives you then auto automatically without you having to do anything to the next toll gate. 
and it works very well. We didn't have any problems with this. It got us there. It, it went around cars. It um, passed cars. Um, it changed lanes. It knew where to get off at the next station. Um, but again, and this isn't limited to uh, Toyota, but there is a limitation to this, that you cannot drive this car on any other road except that road that it was demoed on, the demonstration on. Why is that? Because it requires a very, very precise map. And if, if the, the map that, uh, for this road is not programmed into this car, it can't drive aut autonomously on a regular street. So mapping is very crucial to the, these functions. And until we get the kind of maps that, use, that, are very, that are way better than what we have in today's navigation systems, uh, you know, the, the, the applications of this kind of autonomous driving will be fairly limited. So those are some t trends in safety and some of the uh, pl you know the uh, the hope for the future and also some of the limitations that we currently face and looming challenges uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, just generally speaking what we can expect what are some of the challenges facing the Japan industry as a whole okay well recently we of course have these emission testing scandals right uh, are these are these cars that were getting uh, sold here, being sold here in Japan, are they really achieving the kind of fuel economy that the companies say they are? We've had some problems here with Suzuki, of course. Mitsubishi has, has, has had its share of problems as well. Even Nissan uh, is being accused of, of uh, having some problems in Korea, for example. Uh, the question is who might be next, right? Now, apparently, all of the companies have already self-tested and reported to the government. Oh, we've already taken a double check of our figures, and everything's fine. Uh, we, but, you know, you have to ask yourself, if, if a small company like Suzuki or Mitsubishi is finding pr problems, but a huge company like, um, like Toyota, which has tons and tons of, 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 <laughs> of cars, uh, I'm wondering to myself, how can they test all these cars and vouch for every single test of every single car for a lineup as wide as Toyota's or as wide as Nissan's, right? It's very, very hard, I would think, to, to double check that. But then again, um, so far we've only had these uh, problems with these two. Nissan, by the way, doesn't admit to having any kind of problems in Korea. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, uh, these two admitted to some kind of problems. Nissan says uh, is having a problem with the government in Korea doesn't admit to any wrongdoing there. Um, of course, the other th issue facing all the, most of the um, automakers here is the looming Takata airbag recalls, right? Huge problem. It's been going on since um, 2008 when the recalls began. Uh, I think the, link, the, the list now is up to linked to 13 deaths, 10 of them in the United States, uh, 100 injuries worldwide, and there's about a hundred million uh, inflators, the airbag inflators. That's not a hundred million cars, but a hundred million inflators because a well, car might have several inflators in it. But um, so a hundred million inflators have been deemed defective and probably will need to be recalled through um, 2019. Now, I say, why is that a looming challenge? Because we've already had all these recalls and the car makers are rushing now to try to replace them. The looming challenge is that the recalled Inflators up until today only include inflators that have uh, no desiccant in it, which is desiccant is a drying chemical. They put a ke drying chemical in there to uh, make the chemical more stable so that it doesn't explode with too much force. What's not being addressed is the, the newer inflators that actually have this uh, desiccant in them to make them more stable. And that is being questioned still by U.S. regulators. And so Takata is under pressure now to show to the U.S. regulators that these, this chemical in itself is also safe by 2019. And then if it's not, then there'll be another kind of uh, moment of truth, if you will, where they will have to decide whether or not to recall uh, many, many more inflators after that. The biggest problem with this, besides, of course, the deaths, is the uh, issue of how we're going to replace all these inflators because there, aren't, there just isn't enough supply to uh, replace them all uh, in a timely fashion. Um, 
Industry consolidation, the third point here, that's another thing that we're going to see uh, increasing pressure on here in Japan. Uh, this year we saw it already with Nissan and Mitsubishi coming together in an alliance. Toyota and Daihatsu increased, uh, kind of drew together more closely in their own rights. Uh, basically this year Toyota will take full control of Daihatsu. But there's a question, a question mark out there, and this is often a point of debate among people who watch the industry, is what about the smaller companies like Subaru or, or Mazda or uh, Honda even? You know, it's kind of a middle company. It's, 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 uh, it's not quite big, not quite small. What's going to happen to it? It's very fiercely independent. And then, of course, uh, something like Suzuki, which is, um, which is successful in Japan and successful in India, but doesn't have much of a presence anywhere else in the world and is very dependent on small K cars, or these mini cars that we have in Japan. Doesn't have sophisticated technology in things like hybrids or um, sa advanced safety systems that it needs to compete on a global basis. It tried to, of course, uh, circle wagons or have an alliance with Volkswagen last year, and they couldn't make it work. So they, by them now, are ba basically out in the cold again. What's gonna be the future of a company like Suzuki? Okay. Another uh, kind of, I don't know, looming crisis or uh, question mark over the industry is this. Price fixing and collusion crackdown on Japanese suppliers. For several years now, um, the Japanese suppliers have been under pressure internationally by uh, antitrust authorities in the United States and Japan, and basically all in the EU and Korea, uh, for price fixing. It's a widespread problem among um, suppliers here, or, or at least it was. And um, in the United States alone, uh, 44 companies have been uh, accused or basically um, found guilty of price fixing. They've, t they've indicted 64 individuals. So this is almost unheard of in the antitrust uh, world, where a executive from a Japanese auto, com uh, auto supplier goes to the United States, for example, and is working there for a two-year stint or something, and comes back to Japan. And um, later on, a couple years down the road, the US antitrust uh, prosecutor comes and says, by the way, you're now indicted for price fixing because we know you were price fixing in the United States. And that individual then has a choice, either go back to the United States, go to trial, and uh, go to prison, or try to stay in Japan and uh, basically be, uh, live the rest of his days in Japan because if he leaves Japan, he is subject to being arrested at the airport by US authorities. And it's a huge amount of criminal fines in the United States, $2.7 billion in criminal fines. It's one of the biggest antitrust actions ever by the U.S. authorities. And the latest one came down in June 15th. So this is still going on. The trend is kind of slowing, but they are still indicting people. There were five Japanese suppliers, or Japanese individuals, executives, um, indicted just last week. Another pressure point, uh, resurgence of Hyundai and Kia. And of course, VW. VW had a, a stumble this uh, last year with its uh, its own emissions scandal, but it seems to be recovering quite nicely, and it is being very proactive about reorganizing its company. Okay, um, and of course, there are new rivals from Silicon Valley: Google, Apple, uh, companies like Uber. Uh, these are companies that are taking a new mobility to a kind of the next level. They are all pressuring, and uh, Japanese automakers as well as international automakers in, in the United States and, and Europe, but the Japanese have to come up with a strategy uh, as well to find, find it off, fend it off. Uh, the return of Endaka, we talked about that earlier, of course. The higher yen uh, is the, the, um, the expensive yen is going to eat into profits, and that in turn will eat into uh, their R&D budgets at a time when they need to expand production overseas, and when they need to expand uh, investment into new technologies like the hybrids, electrified drivetrains, new safety systems, etc. And that in turn is balance is, I guess, um, it's, it's also kind of wrapped up in this final point here, which is balancing the shrinking home market with growth overseas. Um, 
Companies here in Japan, of course, have lots of their R&D firepower here. Their expertise is based here. And their production, a big portion of their production backbone is based here. But yet they're selling, all their growth is going overseas. None of, the, in fact, the, the Japan market is shrinking. So it's a very big problem for them. How can they maintain that, that, that base here in Japan, that expertise in Japan, but yet focus on the overseas markets. Toyota, for example, says it needs to maintain about three million units of production here in Japan in order for it to basically be an effective company. Nissan's level, because it's a smaller company, says it needs about one million uh, of, of production to be s keep it here in Japan in order for it to be an effective company. But with uh, the shrinking home market that's becoming, and the endaka, that's becoming very, uh, it's becoming a more risky proposition. Okay. And I put this here, this is, uh, we, I mentioned Hyundai Kia. This is, this is why I call them the resurgent Hyundai Kia. This is their new answer to uh, the Japanese electronic, or the electric drivetrains. This is their new car called the Ionic, and it comes in a standard hybrid variety, an all electric variety, and a plug-in hybrid variety. And that's going on sale this year, and they have high hopes for that to be a challenge to cars like the Prius. And that concludes my presentation. I just want to say thank you, and uh, don't forget to share your news. Uh, tips are always appreciated. Uh, news tips, that is. You don't have to pay me anything extra on top of that. <laughs> and then uh, also, by the way, I'll just put in a, s a little plug. I'm looking for a new news assistant here. So uh, we, I, it's, during my time here, it's just me and a news assistant. My news assistant, after eight years of working with me, is finally retiring. So I'm looking for a new news assistant. If you have any recommendations, I'm always open to that. Um, we've had a bureau here in Japan, Automotive News, since the uh, early 80s. And like many of the bureaus here, we have been shrinking. Uh, we used to have three people here, believe it or not, uh, during the golden age. Now it's just down to me and the news assistant. And uh, I, I'm looking for a replacement so I don't get too lonely. And then these are some pictures of just some uh, cool cars that I've seen around on the streets here in Tokyo. So, uh, and, um, and this one's mine. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> just joking. <laughs> and that's my, uh, that'll, that'll conclude it. Um, I'd like to, t I don't know what, how much time we have left, about 20 minutes or so, if you, you want to ask questions or get into a discussion. And um, I think at this point I'll just sit down. Thanks for your time. So thank you very much, Hans. It was a very comprehensive picture of what's going on in the car industry uh, in Japan and elsewhere. So we can take some questions from the floor if anyone has any. Yes, sir. Hi, this is my Takashi Sendo, working for the Michelin, one of the tire suppliers. You, you say that there is a minimum production level, like a Toyota 3 million hundred. Also, our D this station in Japan. Also, there are other concepts called mother factory, that like a Toyota's Nakamachi. They believe that the expertise production expertise are developed there and then disseminated to the overseas. Would that your minimum three million and the one million Nissan Toyota? Would that if it be, gets below to that, would that affect their concept of mother factory in Japan? <laughs> That's a good. Uh, that's an excellent question. So, if they f if the uh, car makers fall below their self-imposed uh, floor of three million f local production, will it really impact things that dramatically? Will it impact their mother factory concept? I don't know. That's a good question. I don't think they've ever had to deal with it, and I'm guessing maybe it's not as dramatic as they make it sound. I think there's a lot of actual political consideration that goes into that because uh, especially a big company like uh, Toyota or Nissan has a lot of political capital in, involved and in, invested in, hey, we have to, uh, not necessarily for our own benefit, but we have to at least support the government, support the local society here, give back to the community by maintaining this figure. So I think there's more to it than just uh, the efficiency of their own operations. That said, um, there's another side to this as well. They have mother factories in Japan, that's for sure, and they're the most experienced globally. But at this stage, for most of these companies, including Toyota, uh, Honda, uh, Nissan, they have very uh, long-established 
operations overseas as well. And some of those factories now are coming or rising to the level where they too can become uh, uh, mother plants of their own. So they are taking on that role and, and uh, as a global factory for let's say a new factory, as a mother plant for a new factory in Mexico or a new factory in Africa or something like that. So there are other factories that can serve that role. Yes, sir. Um, I'm Martin Fritz with the German magazine Wirtschaftswoche. Um, you mentioned the um, increasing complexity of building um, car models all over the world in high numbers. One answer is the standardization, uh, for example, Toyota, new global architecture, and so on. If you compare the Japanese uh, makers with the other makers, especially the German ones, do you think they are behind in standardization? Um, do they have um, do they have to speed up this or? What's what's your especially to Volkswagen for example has started this in 2008 I believe. Mm. Uh, what's what's your assessment? Well, that's a good that's a good point. I, I I don't know. That's a good question. Are the Japanese behind, for example, the, the Europeans in in standardization? Of course, the, Volkswagen is famous for actually getting on that bandwagon very early, so they had an early lead, and they're famous for their uh, development of their own. Uh, a modular approach. But you know, I don't think, I think maybe you could say uh, companies like Toyota might have been a little bit late to the party because they are now kind of rolling out their own versions of it just now. And same with Nissan. But I'm not sure, it, uh, it's partly a matter of semantics because if you go to a company like, uh, for example, a Honda and you say, well, how come? Uh, how come you don't have a modular platform, or how come you're not modularized your your cars like like Volkswagen? And they'll say, well, we've been doing that all along. We just don't call it modular. Like we have a front end, we have a middle end, and we have a back end, and we kind of mix and match that. It's just that we had never call it modular. It's just the way we've done things. Um, but you're right. I think they're they're coming along maybe a little bit uh, slower than than uh, some of the the companies in Europe, Volkswagen notably. I think though they may be well ahead of other companies like the the um, the American companies or maybe some of the smaller players in Europe, for example. Uh, you know, Subaru just came out with a new global platform, so all their cars now will be based on one platform. Mazda is basically the same way. So. You know, they, they may be catching up late or it, entering that game late, but I think that they are just going to be as, as equally effective at that strategy. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Krokler from ZDF. Uh, in the beginning, you were talking about the peak. Maybe it's over where we, we reach already the peak. Uh, yes, I want to agree for the uh, conventional vehicles, but you addressed already, and this was in the beginning uh, uh, issue which I want to ask, uh, but uh, how about autonomous driving? Maybe that will be a, a new enlarging part. And also and or uh, M&A. I think that's becomes very interesting over the next years. But uh, now to, to my question, just recently, and this means uh, yesterday or today, I could uh, read on, on, on uh, German uh, magazines that uh, in Europe and uh, also in Germany, uh, there is uh, at least a starting a discussion uh, uh, to ban diesel or gasoline engines in 2050. Mm. Uh, so this would become to a total new picture. So how, how do you see this uh, banning uh, diesel and gasoline engines maybe in this uh, decade of 2050? Well, that's, that's another excellent question. I think it's going to be very, I think maybe some markets, maybe like Germany, that's very advanced and a very uh, a compact market, that's a possibility. Also a very, uh, very affluent market where people can afford those kind of vehicles because it costs a lot to buy an EV or a fuel cell or even an advanced hybrid. Uh, I don't think you can get rid of these the, these internal combustion engines globally because you're going to still have markets like um, India or Southeast Asia or South America, Latin America, Africa, where the only thing they can afford is a w old fashioned dirty engine that, that burns gasoline or diesel, especially diesel if the, the, the fuel is cheap. So um, I don't think you can get rid of it on a global basis, but you can maybe do it uh, market by market. I think that could be an opportunity for uh, for the Japanese. 
uh, at least the big players. You see c companies like Honda or Toyota or Nissan, they are very forward-looking in their, their electrified drivetrain strategies. Uh, you look, uh, even at Mitsubishi, uh, you know, they see the uh, electric drivetrain as a way forward. So the, I'd be more worried for the impact on the smaller Japanese car makers like Subaru or Mazda or Suzuki for that matter. Uh, and what that, how they would fit into that, that scenario because they would probably need to, that would be a force, I think, for consolidation for them to partner up with a bigger company that has that kind of technology. Any other questions from the floor? Yes, sir. My name is Khalil. <laughs> I'm honored member. Thank you very much for the presentation. In the last 50 years, there was a lot of revolution in the auto industry. <coughs> and I'm not sure, sorry, is, is your phone mic switched on? Is it okay now? That's good, yeah. Okay. In the last 50 years, there was a quite a revolution in this industry. Now, you talked about a new technology is coming up. Okay, artificial intelligence, maybe iCloud, and so many things happening. My question is, what's going to happen in the next 50 years? And will <coughs> auto industry shift to new areas and places? Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, good, good question. I mean, I think if you, what are the, like, the catchphrases that you hear executives say a lot these days is, You're, you will see more change in the next five years than we saw in all the last 30 years, or then they, they usually maybe insert different like decades for 30 years, 50 years, 70 years. <laughs> You'll see more change in the next five years. And that's basically their expression for the fact that we are at a time of rapid uh, change as due to all these new technologies that we just talked about today. And um, if you look out, 50 years from now, I don't know what could be the, 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 the outlook for that. I mean, Toyota is one of the kind of the companies these days that actually looks out to the 50 years and, or plans out to 2050. The last, last year they came out with a new kind of long range plan about where they want to take the company in like by 2050. I mean, they're looking way out. All the current like workers for the company will be dead and gone by the time this plan is enacted, if it is enacted, but they're thinking that far ahead. And uh, their plan is basically to eliminate the uh, internal combustion engine. I think they'll have it in limited functions, maybe for some markets, but basically down to 1% of their total lineup will be having an internal combustion engine. Everything else will be electrified some way, uh, either with batteries or hopefully, they hope, with hydrogen. So that's the kind of radical thinking that a leader like Toyota sees over the next you know, couple decades. Whether or not that opens the door to new centers of the industry, uh, it's hard to say. I think maybe one of the centers of the industry, if you were thinking kind of uh, futuristically, might be China. And they might be able to take a, a leapfrog if they can somehow harness uh, new technologies like uh, advanced driver s safety systems or autonomous driving, if they are able to get a lead in that technology somehow, uh, that might turn China from a fast follower into a leader of the industry. Um, that's one possible cult, you know, cradle of future uh, automotive culture. But I don't see necessarily uh, any other regions popping up as like a, an industrial force in, in this. I, probably I would predict even by 2050, you'll still have countries like, um, regions like the United States, United, uh, Europe, and uh, Korea, Japan, anchoring the global industry. Maybe India, maybe India. Um, it's got a long way to go before the local market can support that kind of uh, advanced technology that would turn it into a leader, though. You, already you see companies like Tata, you know, taking over and buying uh, overseas brands. So you're getting a little bit of the influx of that technology. They're buying the technology of Jaguar, Land Rover, et cetera. They're becoming Indian companies. Um, 
So you're having an influx of technology, but yet it's not really supported by the local market yet. So that's, I think, where you're going to have uh, India struggling. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for your uh, explanation. My name is Honda. It's uh, affiliate and nothing to do with Honda family, unfortunately. Uh, well, you ex uh, explained that the new technology is coming in, of course, autonomous driving and electricity car instead of engine. So uh, thinking about the PC industry, PC manufacturer were there and quite successful. And uh, OS is coming up, Intel is coming up, and at the end of the day, uh, o operation system company is a champion, mm -hmm. and uh, every single uh, PC manufacturer has to obey or has to follow Intel or, or, or somebody else. So uh, looking at the industry of automobile, such kind of situation is coming up, uh, like uh, for example, uh, Google is a champion, and Toyota, Nissan, whoever has to buy operation system from Google, and they are just become, a, how should I put it, a assembler of hardware. And operation system and a key device like uh, electricity motor is a champion. Such kind of you know, game changer or game change will happen in, within the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's interesting. That's, that also is a very interesting idea. And it kind of ties into the earlier question about where you see the uh, one kind of possibility for where the future will go with the industry. And that's what, maybe that's another alternative uh, solution. That the, the real value that's going into these cars is created by the technology companies like Google or Apple. They're the ones who are making the guts, the, the software that goes into the, com the cars and makes it run, right? And then the, the, the old school companies like Toyota and um, Volkswagen, they just bend the metal and make a metal package for the, uh, the, all the computers that are inside. And that is something that uh, that is very realistic possibility, and I'm, uh, the technology companies would love to see that happen, no doubt. But the automotive companies, for their own right, are very aware that that is a, 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 uh, a dangerous possibility, really could undermine their whole business model. And that's why you see companies like Toyota, I, I hate to go back to Toyota again, but they just, um, they're very aggressive in that field, exactly, of, of trying to bring software expertise in-house because they realize that they don't have the software engineers to design things like a uh, an onboard computer that can look, scan all the cars around it and figure out oh this is this is a uh, dog that's running into the street and here's uh, somebody crossing with a baby carriage that's a baby carriage not a, a cow and which way is it going oh the dog is jumping it's zigzagging across the road oh, what do I do now and then try to figure that all out and and plot a course of of driving they don't have the kind of the the software expertise to to, to deal with that so Toyota solution was last year they invested one billion dollars, spent basically took one billion dollars out of their huge war chest and just plunked it down and created a new company called Toyota uh, Research Institute. That's a huge sum of money. They formed it out of no nowhere. It's a fully owned subsidiary of Toyota. They, uh, they, uh, the headquarters is in um, in Silicon Valley, but they also have offices in Boston, and now they have one in Ann Arbor, Michigan, so that's close to the auto industry. And they basically, they went headhunting and took up, they basically thought, thought who are the smartest people in the robotics and, in, uh, and the uh, 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 software industry, in, uh, artificial intelligence industry, and they just bought these people and brought them in-house. And that's how they're s approaching the, this, this, uh, this issue. I know that uh, Nissan is, is uh, very aware of that problem. Honda, for example, just opened their own uh, artificial intelligence uh, center here in Tokyo to do the exact same thing. It's a, on a smaller scale, but the idea is the same. Bring in this kind of expertise from outside, from the tech field, and bring it into the automotive field. So um, that's their auto industries, or at least the Japan auto industry's response to that, and it's a very real threat that they're uh, taking seriously. 
Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, a great. Yeah, a great uh, presentation, Hans. Thanks very much. Uh, one of the things that I was interested in was this uh, emissions story. And just to kind of, from your side of the fence, I guess, to get your view on how this crisis was handled from a sort of media and public relations point of view. Obviously, VW got their knickers in a twist quite early on, and it was a story that sort of little bits of information kept appearing out of nowhere. Uh, and obviously, now Japanese companies are finding themselves in the same uh, in the same boat. So, just what are the, some some of the sort of lessons learned from a from a media handling point of view that you think we could do better moving forward? Okay. Well, you know, I think in some ways. Well, I think with just to just to go back and maybe review, um, Mitsubishi uh, had a uh, emissions uh, problem. They had been testing their cars wrong and giving the wrong figures to the government. That's just the background on this story. And then uh, Suzuki also had the same problem. It was a huge story here in Japan, but they managed to contain it because they said, "Oh, it's only here in Japan." So right there, uh, both companies were able to kind of. Uh, cut out the international fallout and uh, by containing it in Japan. If that had somehow uh, jumped borders and become a wider global problem, you would have seen the media go, uh, media frenzy go much, much more berserk over this story. Our own publication, Automotive News, uh, didn't handle it as as closely, for example, as we did the Toyota. Uh, acceleration recall, the uh, sudden uh, unintended acceleration recalls from the 2010. We didn't handle it as, as closely as that. Why? Because it doesn't affect most of our readers uh, or overseas. So I think they really dodged a bullet in that way because they were able to contain it here. Whether or not, you know, you know are there some kind of hidden uh, it, emissions tests or irregularities that really are out there and affect global cars? I don't know. That, that could that could pop up later, possibly. Right now, the, the companies say it's, it's just contained here. So that helps a lot. Um, but I think that the companies handled it pretty well, I think. I think they were up front. They had, had lots of, they were, they were kind of forced to have lots of press conferences by the, uh, the government. The, the ministry forced them to have almost weekly press conferences. So that helped. The companies got out and addressed it pretty forthrightly. Um, and uh, I, I don't know. I think the media... I think the media reaction was was all right. I don't see it. I didn't see it as over the top, um, and I think the companies themselves handled it pretty well. You had the the, ex the top executives coming out and addressing it, um, which is always a good sign. I mean, I hate to compare it to. I'll compare it a little bit to Takara because I, uh, because they're the kind of the uh, the other extreme, more kind of in in house kind of shielding the company from media scrutiny and not getting out ahead of the thing and being transparent, but more kind of a bunker mentality. So you have a little bit of a difference, a contrast with the Takata approach. Um, and from a media point of view, of course, we prefer the, uh, the open approach because it's much more transparent. You can see what's going on. The company looks like it's taking responsibility. And uh, I think the public can uh, establish a better uh, sense of trust when they have the, the the leaders of the company coming out and trying to address the the issues. So I think that was a smart move, and it it's a it's a pattern that was maybe established originally by um, Toyota uh, during its uh, recall crisis in 2010. Uh, Toyota got off to a very slow start. They kind of had the bunker mentality. They didn't they didn't register with Toyota at first that this was a a, a global problem for them, and when it finally clicked, they were very proactive in getting out ahead of it. And so that's how the Toyota now mentality is to just basically get out there and, and address the problem as soon as you can, even if you don't know all the facts, have a face, <coughs> get out in public, and say as much as you know. And a classic example of how they uh, put that into practice after the, um, after the uh, 2010 recall crisis was last year when they had their... Uh, new chief communications officer, I guess what it was, chief CC, chief communications officer. They hired an American to come in, well, she, they didn't hire her, they brought her in from the United States. She was uh, someone uh, who was a high-ranking public official, uh, public affairs official from the United States. They brought her to 
to Japan. She was a woman, <clears throat> a foreigner. They had her a very high position called a chief communications officer for global responsibility. And I don't know if you recall what happened, but she was uh, accused of uh, trying to import some controlled uh, medicines. And uh, she ended up being uh, taken into custody. And there was a, uh, it was a very bad, embarrassing situation for Toyota. Um, right away, they held a conference. And Akio Toyota came out and <laughs> there was not a lot he could say because, first of all, he didn't know probably a lot of the details of the case. Second of all, there's a lot that he can't say. But he came out and he, he to the limits of what he could say and what he, he did know, he said what he could. And it was, a, it, from the press point of view, it was somewhat frustrating because, well, we didn't get a lot of questions answered. But at the same time, there's nothing more for us to do. Are, you know, it kind of deflated the, the media storm because he was out there just saying what we know. And you're not going to get anything more from us because this is all we know. <laughs> no use digging around. Um, and it deflated the, 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 the crisis rather, rather easily, I thought. So that's another case where somebody gets out ahead of the uh, situation and talks directly to the, to the media in a transparent way. I've got a question for you, if you don't mind. Um, there was a, a interesting uh, story the other day about a Tesla S, uh, a Model S, um, going through a, a down a road in Kazakhstan, and it it hits a um, went into a tunnel. And the tunnel was flooded, but the the Tesla Model S just the drivetrain actually, you know, th it drove through the tunnel. It floated. So, okay. yeah, he, that, yeah, so right, yeah. yeah, Elon Musk put out a tweet afterwards saying, this isn't recommended, but look, you know, the Tesla floats like a boat. <laughs> um, just got me to thinking with all the talk about climate change and flooding of coastlines and such like and so forth. Have you ever heard any car companies talk about the idea of, well, we need cars that can actually double as boats? <laughs> as well. The floatable boatable. The floatable boatable, yeah. I'm trying to think, in my seven years or eight years on the job, uh, or almost ten years, I guess now, have I ever come across, in my time on this job, have I ever come across a car company saying, we're going to make a boat car? No, never. <laughs> but you know what? There was a, and I'll, I, I'll, I'm going to take your question just one step farther and talk about flying cars because <clears throat> um, Toyota had this in this kind of weird media um, parlay that they had a couple years ago. They said, one of the executives said something to the effect of, we are working on a kind of a flying car, a flying vehicle, I think it was how they put it, maybe something like that. And then it got the media into a frenzy like, oh, uh, uh, Toyota is working on a flying car. And, um, well, it turns out, uh, fast forward for like a year from that comment, turns out what they did was they came out with this uh, hoverboard, which is like a floating uh, skateboard. So that was their, uh, it was just a kind of a one-off uh, engineering public relations stunt, and they had like a floating, uh, that used uh, magnets and, and uh, to float a skateboard, and so that was their idea of a floating vehicle, so to speak, or a flying vehicle. But I've never had anybody propose a boat, not yet. Okay, uh, moving quickly on then. Um, <laughs> the gentleman here talked about, um, well, the Internet of Things and the fact that the, IOS, the IS, sorry, the OS will rule. Um, you talked there about Toyota going out, spending a billion dollars, scooping up all these software engineers. There's also speculation that you know, Apple's doing the opposite, scooping up all these car engineers and to to build the iCar. I mean, is that is that just um, a dream speculation? Have you heard anything about that? About the about the iCar? Yeah. That's like one of the like most closely held secrets out there, uh, and I don't know much about the iCar. Uh, the, I leave that to my Silicon Valley counterpart in um, in California. That's his responsibility, and he I, I don't know that he knows much about it either. Um, they are scooping up uh, automotive engineers for sure because they need the expertise about things like chassis control, uh, manufacturing, all, all the other things that, that, <laughs> that a car needs beside the computer. They, they, of course, lack that expertise, so they need the automotive engineers. Um, 
I haven't heard much about the the Apple Car. I did hear, however, that the Apple has an R and D center in or setting up an R and D center in Yokohama, apparently, and part of that is geared toward uh, automotive. And but I, beyond that, it's just a rumor that I've heard. And if any of you know anything more, please come and see me afterward. <laughs> I'd love to hear more <laughs> about what you know about Apple in Yokohama. So. Okay, if we, are there any more questions? Or we can go to food and drink at the back where you'll have a chance to ask any more questions to Hans over there. But again, if you can all join me and thanks for Hans coming out this evening again, forsaking beer gardens to come and talk here. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you for going easy on, my, on me with the questions. All right. Thanks. I'll be, uh, I'll be around if you want to talk more, and I look forward to hearing your, your thoughts. Thank you.